So it is my pleasure to announce the seminar by Professor Bedrao, who doesn't need introduction anymore because he's been here for four weeks already. And actually, as far as I know, he's been telling me that he wants to come back many, many times. I have to lie a little bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so he will talk about quantum biology, right? Yeah. It's recorded now. It's Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know if I need it, but um, it's actually a, a great pleasure for me to talk about this topic because it's something that um, <coughs> that I've gone into, into relatively recently. Even though my interests are probably. Um, a long term ones, maybe they stretch back five, uh, five or six years. But it's only recently that I really started looking into some of these things uh, uh, seriously. Half of the talk, I mean, it's really very general. It's about basically this gives me an opportunity to talk about things that are fun and I could never get them into a, a, a recognized international journal. Okay, so there will be lots of lots of fun slides with lots of quotes. Um, I guess the first half will be my apology for talking to you about something I don't know anything about, and that's biology, obviously. But uh, given that I'm a physicist and I'm arrogant enough to think that everything in this universe is uh, physics, actually, ultimately, in particular, quantum physics, then I'm going to try to convince you that this also can be explained in the same way. So the first part is really a general discussion, because once you go in into a complex system, area. You get all sorts of philosophies there that people try to subscribe to and I think that's always an interesting thing to, uh, to talk about. So I think a few slides in the beginning will just be very general ones. So, you know, basically we are really going to try to bridge the gap between physics. So even going from physics into chemistry is already a big step. And, and frequently we can't apply the same, the same techniques that we have in physics and we can't analyze models to the same degree of detail in chemistry, and, and we all know that as physicists that we have a bunch of voodoo rules that, that at some level do, uh, I'm not being condescending, that it really is like that. At some, you know, at some level we know that they follow from the Schrodinger equation, but actually chemists never work at that level, they work at a, at a, at a much higher level. And now we are really talking about biology, which, whose, whose main point is not to study you know, formation of, of physical complex systems and so on, but it's really to study the utility of this. Why are they that way? And ultimately, presumably related to some kind of uh, uh, function for survival or whatever else. So it's, it's really a very complicated uh, thing. And the question is, you know, even, there is even a question of is there a continuity between these subjects? Can I really go in as a physicist and apply my arrogant um, attitude of trying to really model down everything to its minute detail. Is that going to work in, in chemistry and biology in the same way that it works in solid state physics? Okay. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting thing. So here is this, um, here is this apology. I have to quote my favorite uh, philosophy. You see how far back I'm going to go. It's going to allow me to quote some of the, some of the guys I know. So, so this guy said there are two kinds of people in this, uh, in this world. Uh, he's not the only guy who classifies people in this way. Uh, basically, one is uh, those who don't know what they're doing, and the other one is those who don't know that they don't know what they're doing. Okay? So what I want to say is that, is that I do know that I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in class one, okay? so I'm aware of my ignorance fully. I think he was criticizing uh, people number two, and he went and argued with everyone until they killed him. Um, so because he tried to convince them that they all belong to number two class. So in a way that's the beginning of science and I think it's very appropriate to quote him given that I want to talk about science in general and the method of, of science. Here is my real excuse and it comes from a Victorian scientist. I mean, um, <coughs> probably the best time for science at least in, in, in England. And John Tyndall says, we are truly heirs of all the ages but as honest men it behooves us to learn the extent of our inheritance and as brave ones not to whimper if it should prove less than we had supposed. So what that means is be brave, jump into a new area, assume and look at all the knowledge that you have so far, but be bold enough to challenge it and to change it if it's necessary. That's, that was the attitude 150 years ago. I love these guys. If I was to, if I was forced to choose to have, I don't have heroes in my life, I don't like heroes. Usually they are disappointed when you when you see your heroes interviewed or meet them in person, they never live up to any standards. But if I was 
forced to choose a hero it would be from these kind of times. Anyhow, there are two bunches of scientists when it comes to approaches to complex systems. And we physicists typically tend to be in the reductionistic club. Okay, but you will see that it's not all physicists like that. The most famous one is Ernst Rutherford. Okay, this guy has a great statement. I love it. And I fully empathize with this statement. He says, science is either physics or stamp collecting. Okay. What does this mean? It means either you fully understand it where it comes from or you're just listing the phenomena. And chemistry is a little bit like stamp collecting. Note briefly that he was a Nobel laureate in chemistry. He hated that apparently. He never had the Nobel Prize on his wall because he was a little bit ashamed to be a stamp collecting Nobel laureate. Anyhow, we all know what he did. There is a physicist on the other side of the divide. This guy would say, no, you can't apply reductionism everywhere. You can't reduce everything to the Schrodinger equation, if you like, or feel free of it. He would say, he has a very famous article in Science in 1972. He's, of course, a condensed matter physicist, and you'd expect someone from that field of complex systems to say something like that. So he says in this article something very subtle, actually, which is that it is feasible that there are macroscopic features of systems which simply cannot be derived. It's not because of computational difficulty, but even in principle, they cannot be derived from the microscopic description. So not because it would take an exponential amount of time to simulate this on a computer, but simply there is no link. You can prove that you cannot do that. It's very interesting. He didn't substantiate this claim at all. Uh, a postdoc of mine actually has a very beautiful paper. I'll, I'll probably, well, I should probably write his, his name down if I find the text somewhere. I'll use this one. Um, if, you, if you find him, um, um, Basically, this paper, I don't even remember. Probably you should just Google him up because I don't remember exactly. I think you can switch it okay. I don't remember exactly where this was published. His supervisor was Michael Nielsen. So this is with Michael Nielsen. And, and basically, they linked macroscopic features and deriving macroscopic features of, of certain complex systems to a kind of argument that Gödel and Turing used to show that, uh, that basically, um, you can never capture everything in your theory with a certain fixed set of axioms. So there's this famous Gödel's theorem, and I think they relate, make a one-to-one -one mapping between physical observables and what Gödel was showing there. So they really are trying to formalize mathematically what, uh, what Anderson was saying uh, should be true in his intuition. So this guy would say, forget about it. Forget about going into biology with your attitude. You simply have to work with laws which you have to acknowledge only exist at this level. They don't exist at the lower level. They just there isn't any connection. Okay. Like I said, I, I tend to not believe in this kind of, I wouldn't like to live in a universe like this, that's what I'm saying. It's a prejudice. I have a prejudice. Um, this would be a hero of mine. Thomas Huxley, Darwin's Google. This is the guy who defended Darwin more than Darwin defending himself. Here's an, an article that I'm really... So now I'm telling you about biolo biologists, reductionists, and biologists, non-reductionists. Okay? They also exist um, in the same way as physicists exist. It's a very beautiful paper by Huxley. I really, acknowledge, uh, I really re recommend this one to, to you to read it. His prose is amazing. This guy deserves a Nobel Prize in literature. I mean, his command of English is just unbelievable. But that is worth reading. And it's a super, super reductionistic paper, arguing that all of us are just a little bit more sophisticated puppets, marionettes. So the laws of physics are the puppet masters, and we just play the deterministic game according to the laws of physics. He's a biologist, but he fully believes in the, in the reductionistic approach. It's a really beautifully, it's a very old paper, but still very beautifully argued. You know, in the modern incarnation, you'll be, you'll be reading someone like Richard Dawkins with the same idea that it's genetics that kind of controls us all in some way. So he would be, both of them would be strong reductionists. Um, here's actually a, a big biologist as well, a, a modern one if you like, 
And he's very much against this. You can see one of his statements. It just shows a random one saying, well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. You, you know, if you're trying to really reduce everything to genetics, and we know the genes are simple enough that they can be understood chemically, and that presumably means they can be understood quantum mechanically, then you are really missing the large, large point actually there that exists in addition, and somehow you will never be able to really reduce things to, to things like that. So this guy is clearly a non-reductionist. Again, the ratio of these things is different in biology. I would say more biologists probably agree with this than physicists. We tend to really be reductionists because we, we see the power of statistical mechanics. I mean, it's statistical mechanics that gives us the, uh, this, uh, this kind of attitude uh, that we have, that we can really understand complex systems. But you have to be careful with these things. And actually, people now write serious debates in, in, uh, in journals like Nature arguing strongly that physicists should not go into biology with their own attitude of reduction. So it's just not going to work. You get serious people who write comments like that. Who knows? But you have to be careful. Um, here is, of course, Schrodinger. He um, was really the first, I would say, um, recognized physicist to go into biology with quantum mechanics. Of course, connections between biology and physics go way back. Uh, but the first guy to seriously suggest, and this is the most famous quote, uh, that, that basically the living systems may require what he calls other laws of physics, which were not known before. Of course, he's referring to quantum, to quantum physics and, and the fact that classical physics presumably did not explain some of these, some of these phenomena. I think Schrodinger was the first person to go into, into biology and try to explain some things in this way. It's a very famous book called What is Life that apparently got a whole generation of physicists interested into biology and going into biology and then discovering the DNA, for example. So all of this crystallography that was done to discover the structure of DNA was actually done by physicists. Again, that's what uh, gives me this arrogant attitude that I think we should be going into biology even now and, and doing some stuff our own way because biology is far too important to be left to biologists alone. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I think. Anyhow, um, so you know these are just very funny slides. Like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk at a very at a very superficial level, and I think most of you know about this. But the main difference really is that is that somehow quantum physics describes a different domain to classical physics, um, and traditionally we've thought about this in this way. <laughs> but now, now this links a little bit to the quantum information field where recently people were really starting to test this hypothesis and to say, what is it that makes us think that you, you really have to have a, 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 a phenomena like entanglement confined to small domains and why not try to stretch it as much as possible? And we all know about interference of, of, of larger and larger molecules, for example, experiments where people are really testing and saying how big does an object have to be so they definitely cannot go through um, hundreds of leads at the same time, if you like. It cannot be dropped. And as far as we know, there is no limit to such a thing. You really can do it with larger and larger objects. So, so you know, we, we, we do think that, that this divide between quantum and classical, in some sense, is very artificial and it doesn't really exist. Um, so now, Schrodinger, again, was the first person to say, you shouldn't be talking really about superpositions as, uh, of, different, um, of different states as the main difference. You should really talk about entanglement because this is something that really has no, no classical analog. I think his logic was, again, that superposition as a, as a name and interference as a phenomenon exists with classical waves. So you can, you, can, you can talk about meaningfully about superposing different states of, of, your, of your classical electromagnetic field. But what you cannot do with this model is entangle anything. And we know this through Bell's inequalities, of course. This wasn't known to Schrodinger when he wrote this, but he had the intuition that entanglement allows you to do something funny that, uh, that uh, classical physics does. So you know, he wrote it in this famous paper. There is a debate, by the way. I mean, in this lecture, I'm going to try to tell you lots of fun things that I wouldn't normally tell you about. So there is a, Schrodinger was bilingual. Okay? He spoke English and German equally well, actually. And, and there is a big debate, I guess, between England and Germany as to which was the original word that he used for entanglement. One possibility is entanglement itself, 
he published two papers, one in German and one in English in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, uh, which uses the, the word um, entanglement instead of Verschrankung, the unpronounceable word up there, I suppose, which is the German equivalent. So somehow the, the, there is a historical debate as to which paper came first, what was the first word in Schrodinger's mind. You can find some of his lectures on the web, actually. It's interesting listening to him lecture. He was an awesome lecture. He was a really well uh, known uh, public speaker. Anyhow, here is, here is my introduction to the world. So his main idea, he was again the first person to amplify entanglement to the macroscopic. This is how my students waste that taxpayers' money, money when I send them to serious uh, schools and conferences. They make snow, show the cat, okay? So basically, his logic was, if you think that there is something weird with a single quantum event, and if you believe that there is a continuity in the physical description and I can couple a single event to a macroscopic object, then you have to acknowledge that macroscopic objects should behave in, a, in an unusual way. So his famous superposition was a dead cat, just to amplify it so you can see how well made this was. Um, you might have seen this before, I think it's understand. Anyhow, there is lots, there is lots about it, you know, dead and alive cats and so on. Of course, um, you do enter, you know, when you go with a physical attitude into into biological sciences, then you do enter some of these questions at some level. But I mean, for my talk, of course, I'm I'm not going to talk at, at this level. Once you talk, start talking about properties dead or, or, or alive and so on, then I'm really at loss for finding a Hermitian operator that's going to witness you being dead or you being alive. So for physicists, this is really too complicated. So we have to really scale down and talk about some some much simpler things that would be that would be uh, uh, unusual. So you know, again, people talk about entanglement as a spooky action at a distance, and I think all of us have seen this. And the logic is that if I have two entangled particles, and actually this is going to be very much the state in the complex molecule that I will show you describes how certain animals detect the direction of the magnetic field. So it's going to be exactly entangled of this type. So in a sense, in the past, people would talk about measuring this spin up and finding this spin down instantaneously, no matter how far apart these spins are. Of course, in a, in a biological molecule, this is all um, very close to each other. So, you know, we are talking about nanometers or microns at best in some sense, certainly not meters apart or kilometers apart. But again, you can confirm the same effect occurs there, it's as unusual as that. And of course, more than you, I think, again, most of you have seen this and, and heard me talk about it, is that we should really understand these states in terms of separability, which is to say how correlated these subsystems are to each other. So we tend to talk about them being so entangled that you can never pull any one of these three subsystems away from the other two. And again, the interesting property that doesn't have a classical analog is that if you did get rid of one of these spins, if you lost it in a black hole, then the other two would immediately be disentangled. So all of these features are absent from the classical correlations perspective. You can't have that. Uh, you can't have three classically correlated systems and you remove one and the other two are not any longer correlated. That really does not have any, any analog. And I think that's what's unusual. That's kind of our modern way of understanding what's unusual in entanglement. Now the main topic of the talk. Magnetoreception has a, has a very, sometimes a very bad name uh, because um, a lot of crazy people have actually worked on this topic for a long time. Uh, and the guy who gives uh, the whole thing uh, a bad name uh, for the first time is a guy called Franz Anton Mesmer. So to be mesmerized comes from this guy's name, who believed uh, that you should use uh, magnetic fields for therapeutic purposes. He um, was not believed that much in his um, hometown of Vienna, so he had to emigrate to France, I think to Paris, where his popularity exploded. He had lots of rich ladies who paid a lot of money, apparently he was a charming person in addition to being smart, who paid lots of money to be cured by his magnetic uh, uh, field treatments. I don't, I don't really know in detail what exactly he was doing, but that was roughly how long ago this was. In addition, he did argue that animals can actually sense the direction of the magnetic field and then they may be using it for some kind of 
purposes. He extrapolated that to humans, but as far as I know, there is no evidence in humans. So like I say, in modern technical terms, he was a crackpot. He was a loony a little bit, okay? So you shouldn't trust him too much. But at least he started to think about, about this, uh, this idea. Um, there, is a, there is a magician who is very big in the United Kingdom. He does all sorts of tricks, like playing Russian roulette. For, for last New Year, he went in with uh, one bullet in a, in a gun and basically shot into his head without, uh, without uh, of course, killing himself. And it was perceived as a major trick. I think 50 million people tuned in to just watch that for the New Year's Eve. Anyhow, he's a serious, he's a serious magician who uses lots of psychology to guess things about people. He does it in an awesome way, actually. And I think you can read a really nice book called Cheeks of the Mind, where one chapter talks about this guy in particular. Okay, so he was a, a good psychologist, and I think that's why he occurs. But you can learn a little bit about magnetism as well in addition. Now, why would this be a, what was his logic, or what, what is our logic, why a magnetic field would be a useful thing? Why would, why would it be good to be able to detect, detect the direction of the magnetic field? And the answer is that that's just about the only stable thing you can imagine in our environment. So if you say, I'm going to navigate by using stars or the sun, then I think you have a big problem in England because the number of sunny days is maybe one or two a year and you wouldn't get very far as a bird or as a fox or whatever else you are. So basically, anything else, you know, the direction of the wind, formation of clouds, you think about anything in the environment, it really is not permanent. And if you want something that's always there, uh, then, then it really, well, with a, with, a, with a small footnote that I will mention in a second. But basically, Earth's magnetic field is, is, is stable over long periods of time. It's just that every once in a while, and by every once in a while, I mean every 24,000 years, there is a guy called Milankovic who was a, a geologist, and, and the year is called after him, basically. The north and the south of the magnetic field of Earth basically reverse polarity. So this is an interesting statement now, because genetic evolution is much slower than 24,000 years. Basically, 24,000 years ago, humans were more or less the same as, as we are here. And there hasn't been any major, I would say, development during this period. I mean, our culture started, admittedly, only 10,000 years ago, for God knows what reasons. But basically, genetically, we are the same uh, monkeys, I was going to say, as, as they were 24,000 years ago. However, so that means that if you want to catch up with these changes of the magnetic field, maybe you should take into account the fact that the Earth is going to reverse this, and maybe you should be insensitive to the reversal of the magnetic field. That's a very interesting statement. It will be extremely important in what I have to say about the human time. Um, so basically, what, what, what the idea here is that, is that in different parts um, of the globe, the lines of the magnetic field that penetrate the Earth penetrated at a different angle. And the question is, can I tell the inclination of this? And if I can tell the inclination, that's going to tell me which direction the south or the north is, depending on what I uh, want to do with that. The basic explanation of this mechanism, and I think this is what Mesmer would have certainly thought, is a simple classical compass. I mean, this was known for a long time by two sailors, of course. Um, and, and basically, the idea would be I have something like a simply classical magnet, which tends to align itself uh, to the direction of the magnetic field. So, you know, there is, there is no need. What I want to say now is that it really is surprising that that I will have to introduce full quantum mechanics and entanglement to claim that, that, that certain compasses certainly cannot work with this kind of explanation. The most obvious explanation, actually animals do use this, it's well, well known, is a simple, you have, you have some kind of magnetite in some parts of your body. Birds, for example, have it in their beak. And these guys are like ferromagnets. They just align themselves to the direction of the external magnetic field. So notice that they would have a little bit of a problem when the field 
reverses this direction because instead of traveling to the south, they would be traveling to the north during uh, winter, and that would be a bit of a problem for them. So that's usually not the only way in which they tell the, the direction of the magnetic field. There has to be something smarter than that. That's going to be the point. Now, yeah, I'm calling them boring because ferromagnets are really classical in nature. So these guys are really classical spins if such a thing exists, and they really tend to align themselves to the magnetic field. So in that way, they are boring to a quantum physicist because there is no entanglement, there is no quantum correlations in such a model. So all you need, of course, is that the energy due to the magnetic interaction, and this happens to be relevant for people in Singapore, by the way. You can encounter creatures like this if you do a little bit of diving uh, around, around Indonesia there. And, and these creatures actually have the ability to use this ferromagnetic mechanism. And again, you know, the logic is that the strength of this interaction has to be larger. In this case, it's actually 10 times larger than your thermal fluctuations which you naturally encounter, which randomize your spins. So, you know, you're tenfold, tenfold times more likely to align yourself with the magnetic field than be randomized, and that's good enough. That's good enough for these guys to actually detect um, uh, the direction. It's a beautiful article written by two physicists outlining all different mechanisms in which, uh, in which animals uh, detect the direction of the magnetic field. So it's in physics today, it's a very, it's a very general article. Um, okay. Again, the problem is that this is sensitive to the polarity. Any ferromagnet will just flip, all the spins will flip the direction as soon as the external magnetic field uh, flips directions. And now I'm going to tell you about birds. Certain birds, in this case, we have very strong evidence, don't do compasses. They don't do classical physics. They really solve this problem in a genuinely quantum mechanical way. The evidence, there are many layers here, and the evidence to connect each of these layers is frequently very circumstantial. But this is the nature of the topic. That's why I had the apology at the beginning to tell you that I'm going to go in with full blast physics reductionistic attitude and I make no more apologies for that. It could all be wrong. That's what I'm saying, in other words. You have to carefully examine this at every level. So birds brains. The first time I, I mentioned this idea to someone, I don't know how, how, how clear this will be to you, but the person said, wow, this is the first example of, of flying qubits. <laughs> so people talk about stationary qubits, you know, qubits that are localized in your cavities or wherever else in traps. And then they talk about photons being the flying qubits conveying the information between these guys. And the person said, here is the first example of successful flying qubits in birds' brains. Actually, they are really in the retina of a bird's eye. And you know, now you can debate semantically whether retina is part of the brain or is part of your uh, photo detection mechanism. I have no idea and I don't care about it, but basically we know where these molecules would be, would be localized. I'm going to talk about this work. I'm not going to have the chance because this is really just a standard setting and I want to let you go within, a, within an hour and allow for some questions. I'm not going to have the chance to talk about another prominent direction. I probably will be doing it tomorrow within my standard lectures, which is really photosynthesis. Then we have also quite a lot of evidence that photosynthesis and its efficiency cannot be explained in any other way than fully quantum mechanically, which means you actually really need to engage entanglement. It cannot be understood without not just coherence, but entanglement. That's really interesting. Um, OK, now let me tell you a little bit about this. I was laughing. I organized a workshop in Singapore where I invited biologists, chemists, physicists, and computer scientists to debate these issues. It was a mess at the beginning. Because we tried to explain to biologists what quantum mechanics is all about. And this was really cool. I mean, this made me laugh more than any comment. And this was really interesting. Uh, more our inability to identify with what they know than actually what they really know. These are smart guys, but I think physicists were so much frequently emerged into details. And we start to argue about details. For them, it's all the same. You know, superposition, non-locality, entanglement, coherence, whatever, it's all the same. You just need to explain one of them and tell them it's all the same for all practical purposes for you. But we start to argue a lot, and it's very, very exciting. Now, these guys, European robins, OK? So what they do, I mean, there may be many other birds, but there is a couple in, in Frankfurt. It's really a funny story. It's a couple, two German professors, who basically have worked with these birds 
for last 40 years. So here is what they do. These are really classical experiments. They're beautiful. I mean, they're in sharp contrast with what we do in physics. I'll show you the next slide, but basically here is the picture. So what they, these birds tend to uh, fly from the, from the northern parts of Europe. And of course, when the winter starts, or just before the winter starts, they find their way somewhere to the equator to be warm. And, and quite a lot of these birds uh, actually fly via, via Frankfurt, which is also a major airport where you change flights, I think, if you fly from uh, various other parts, but I don't think birds know about it, okay? So basically, the, the Wilczko, the German couple, that I will mention a bit later as well, they get out in, uh, in, 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 I think, twice a year probably, and they get out with big nets. They put them there, and they catch as many birds as they can when they, when they fly in their flight. For those of you who are concerned about animal liberties and so on, I am one such person to some extent, they claim that the survival rate of their birds is actually 100%, which is much higher than the survival rates of the birds who attempt the whole journey. So they keep them nice and warm, they experiment with them a little bit, as you will see, but actually they are all safe and sound apparently and they all go back uh, ultimately in a healthy state. What the guy has is simply a big generator of the magnetic field, some kind of Helmholtz coils, I guess that's the way we call them in, in physics. They put them inside this cage, they change the direction of the magnetic field externally, and then they simply observe which direction the bird would go inside the cage. So the bird goes in, in, in one direction, then scratches a little bit of darkened paper that's pasted around this thing. And the scratch marks tell you in which direction the bird is going. Okay? That's as simple as that. Contrasted with ion trapping and both condensation. Huh? Mm -hmm. Even I could be with this experiment. I don't know. It's a beautiful thesis, I think, made even here online by Chris Rogers from, from Oxford, a chemist from Oxford who studied these things quite a lot in the first few chapters, really beautifully explained the whole thing. Anyhow, they did experiments a long time ago where they tested the sensitivity of birds. So these are the guys, Welch course. They tested the sensitivity of birds to reversing the polarity of the magnetic field. So the birds already hone in to certain strength of the field because they evolved to detect in the range of Earth's magnetic field. So no one cares whether they can tell how big this field is. But what they can tell is the inclination. And that's what matters to them. They want to know how close to the equator they are and what's the direction in which they need to, they need to fly. So basically, if you reverse the polarity of the field, so you, you maintain the angle but you reverse the north and south, the bird continues to fly in the same direction. And this was, this was a major problem for these guys in 71. They couldn't explain that. They were stunned. How come the bird doesn't care? See, thermomagnets can do it. Of course, for some of you may be anticipating that a singlet state doesn't care about any rotation uh, on each of the qubits. And I think you can already guess what's going to be coming in the quantum mechanical model. Anyhow, so this is the other side saying that if the, if the angle is in this direction, so if you change the angle, then the bird reverses and says, oh, now it's actually the, the, the right direction, is in the opposite direction to what I was doing. But again, if you switch the polarity, so these are the experiments that they did, the bird will still continue in that direction because the angle is exactly the same as before. Okay? No polarity information whatsoever. They do all sorts of interesting things with these guys. The second issue, so here are the pictures from actually, I think that there are a few papers in Nature recently that you can also find with this kind of experiments. So this is simply this uh, darkened paper, and you can see, I mean, these are not precise experiments. These are not going to be 99.99% efficiency of detecting the excited state, okay? So for them, this already means the birds are going in the right direction, okay? You see the uncertainty is, uh, is 5 by 4 or bigger, right? Um, anyhow, here, they, here, here is what they are telling me the direction is. And then they play all these tricks of changing polarity and then they see how it goes. But the key in these experiments was to test the sensitivity to light. So first of all, first of all they basically cover birds' eyes. 
and they say, can they see the magnetic field now? And of course they cannot see it. I mean, it's a bit of a joke. I mean, they, they don't quite see it in the way that, uh, that we see things, I suppose. It turns out to be remarkably close. So this to them actually says that it's some kind of visible light excitation. It's an optical excitation that triggers the whole mechanism. In fact, they can close one eye and test whether it's only in one eye that they, that they have this ability, and that happens to be the case as well. So you can close one eye, uh, the other one will do the job, vice versa, you can no longer test that. So you can see here that if they, if they change the frequency of light as well, if they kind of, you know, if, if they change from whatever is the, the 600 nanometer, and if they vary that within the visible range, then there is only a certain color, in a way, that will, that will, or certain range of, narrow range of colors that will, that will result in a successful identification, the rest will simply randomize, uh, randomize their choice. So in a sense, it's not even the whole visible spectrum, but it's a very narrow range. So to them, this says that whatever does the job within this complex molecule in their eyes, it's something that's optically excited, and then does something else, whatever this something else is. This is another piece of the, of the puzzle. It has to be dependent on, on visible frequencies of light. That's in addition to being insensitive to the uh, reversal of polarity. So here is, just a, here is just a summary of these two points. Secondly, it's highly sensitive to the strength of the magnetic field as well. So this is what they try to do. They said, OK, the bird can detect um, um, 50 millitesla. But can it detect 70? And we know that there is a very narrow range of Earth's magnetic fields centered around this value. And if you really go outside of these values, they're not going to be able to do much. So in a way, it is really very sensitive to the strength of the magnetic field. And that's another piece of the puzzle. If you're starting to construct a Hamiltonian, which is what a typical reductionist would love to be able to do, and I think we can do it, then actually you, you really want to know exactly the details of all the coupling strengths and so on. But the bottom line is that the simple compass will not do the job. Ferromagnets can never have all of these features together in the model. It's taken something like 20 years to actually come up with a model. And the model looks a little bit like this, okay? Uh, you see, now I'm becoming a, a typical chemist, actually. I don't even know how to read these diagrams properly, but let me try to do as well as I can. What you have is some kind of um, complex molecule here. We're really talking about something like hundreds of thousands of atoms. But what matters is one particular optical excitation. So in this complex molecule, in the ground state, you have a singlet, um, a singlet state of two electrons. So of course, more, at most two electrons can be in one, in one level. And what happens, apparently, so there's lots of circumstantial evidence for this, but you know, it's not as evident as ion trapping like that. That's the, that's the top of the complex system. What happens about is when the photon is absorbed, one of these electrons gets excited, as it would. It goes to an excited state. Okay? And then it wanders off to another part of the molecule. And what this means to us in physics is that these two electrons are no longer in an eigenstate of the original Hamiltonian, whatever it is the Hamiltonian of this complex molecule. So, they are in a stationary state initially, in bird's eye. Thermal excitation is not big enough to excite them at all because it's much smaller than h bar omega for, for optical excitations. So you need a photon. The photon gets absorbed. The electron wanders off. And now the singlet state is no longer a stationary state, which means it starts to evolve. And it starts to flop between the singlet and the triplet. And amazingly enough, that's what the bird is somehow tuning to measure. How quickly do you flop between these two states? In fact, the model is very simple. And there is lots of evidence that you don't need more than this. You could make it with all 100,000 molecules. Of course, you will never be able to simulate this in reality. But there is very strong evidence. I think most of it is presented in the, in the thesis of, of the guy I mentioned, Chris Rogers, which says all you need is a nuclear spin here, which couples to one of the electrons, the guy that stays down there, Okay? And then you need to describe the spin of that electron. So the nuclear spin, the spin of one of the electrons, and the spin of the other electron that wanders off. And the nuclear spin is there just because of the Zeeman splitting that's going to be sensitive to the magnetic field. 
but otherwise the main dynamics is actually the dynamics of the electron that wanders off. Okay? So let me tell you the rest of the part of the story. As the singlet starts to go between the singlet and triplet, at some stage you get a recombination of these two electrons and basically you either go into certain chain of chemical reactions from a singlet state. This is like a measurement, but it's a, it's a chemical measurement. So singlet state is able to produce a whole sequence of chemical reactions that actually trigger off the neurological response of the bird and the bird starts to see the magnetic field in some sense. Very circumstantial, all of these things. If the triplet state is there, nothing exciting happens. So if you're in the triplet state, so it's all to do with the probability during a certain period of time to be in the singlet state. This is called a singlet fraction for us, and it's a measure of entanglement, by the way. Just want to announce that now, because that's going to be one of the interesting things. So it really matters how much time you spend. Here are the singlets, both coupled to the external magnetic field. So it's the two, sorry, this is the two electrons in a singlet state that couple to the magnetic field, and then there is a nuclear spin coupled to one of, the, one of these spins. Hugely complex. This DA, like I said, it's hundreds of thousands of atoms, but apparently it's good enough to model it with three spins, and you will produce all the experimental results. That's really stunning. Who says that reductionism doesn't work in biology? See what I'm saying? May fail in some other areas, I don't know. And here is an example of typical Rabi flopping style between the singlet and the triplets. You'll be measuring it over a certain amount of time, you'll be measuring the fraction, the probability to be in the singlet state. You start in the singlet state then you have some kind of flopping depending on the direction of the magnetic field that you have. So these molecules, I don't know if I have a nice picture there, I mean this is one of these pictures. These molecules, they have an unisotropic shape and they are basically, um, they are positioned inside the retina like a bunch of radars, like an antenna, all in different directions. So each one of them samples a different kind of rate because the lines of the field, magnetic field, will actually have a different angle with, with the molecule depending on where it's stationed in the retina. So the bird can really get the full image. Actually, people have taken an image of Frankfurt and then they've translated it uh, into what the bird presumably sees in terms of the magnetic field on top of Frankfurt. It's very exciting. Right? It's amazing that we can do something like that. So basically, the nuclear spin is here. The electron spins are here. They start to flop depending on the, on, the, on the magnetic field, and what you're measuring is really the rate of that, or what the bird is measuring. Um, and here's the kind of stuff that chemists and now we are starting to use as well. Uh, basically, you, all you're calculating is some kind of evolution with your Hamiltonian that I gave you previously. This is the initial state of your system. Um, and you're looking at the fraction of the time that your state staying in the singlet state and then converts into the probability to have a chemical reaction that's going to lead to a neurological response. So the bird really translates the angle, the inclination, into the chemical product that then triggers off perception to a different uh, degree. It's an angle-dependent quantity, and that's the main thing. So the, the strength of the magnetic field is not so important because it's fixed uh, to a certain range. And here is a fun slide explaining what birds do, how they solve the master equation okay, as they fly. I will show you what kind of master equation you have to write, actually. This is another serious area where physicists, we've done a lot of open system approach to, uh, to complex systems. Biologists and chemists are not so used to it. They don't know what a Lindblad equation is and so on. Some of them question whether this is the right equation as well, and rightly so. But actually, there are lots of... And there are lots of approaches that we know about, mathematically speaking, that are not really available uh, to them. Klaus Schulten was the guy, by the way, who uh, proposed um, the radical pair uh, compass mechanism, the fully quantum based. He's, a, he's an ex-physicist, so to speak, who sits in Urbana uh, and basically works on complex biological systems. That's a big research group there. So here is again this Robin guy. I think what I want to get to is simply the, the full model, and I want to tell you what we found out at some stage. I probably don't have that much time. If some of you have to, have to leave, I'll try to squeeze it within a few minutes, okay? So basically, here is the picture of the eye, which I already explained, and here is the shape of the molecule, and here is the block sphere representing each of these spins, if you like. And the critical piece of evidence that was important to us to be able to gauge the size of, of noise now and to be able to see how quickly the singlet deteriorates 
was a recent paper uh, published here where basically they tried to deface the whole molecule deliberately by applying a perpendicular oscillating magnetic field to the whole thing. So they're saying, what if on top of the static magnetic field, we really play funny games with birds, we introduce a very rapidly oscillating, I don't know what that does to birds actually, but presumably nothing, nothing, I mean, nothing of, of importance to life and death. But basically what you see is that you can really randomize their choices by having a, it's like dephasing. So, you know, you start with a singlet state, you kill the phase between 0 and 1 and 1, 0. That's what rapid frequency does to you, as we discussed before. And then you say, now I have no entanglement. Can I actually tell the direction of the, of the magnetic field? And you can see that at some stage you, you or birds can no longer do this kind of stuff. Um, and here is the model. Here is now written with the full, with the full angles, you know, the, the, the t times phi, the, the three-dimensional sphere for the magnetic field. And I don't want to bore you too much with the details, but here is roughly how the model works. This is, this is the only slide of substance in the whole talk for a physicist, really. So basically what you have is you have a density matrix of three spins. You have the Hamiltonian part of the evolution without noise. And now you're saying I'm going to do the Lindblad side equation where I'm going to take into account the fact that there is a projective measurement continuously on asking the state, are you a singlet or a triplet? How does this happen? I have no clue. I'm a physicist. I'm a simpleton. Even, even chemists find it difficult to understand it. So my, my interpretation is really this is a measurement. It's a continuous measurement. I don't know how it's measured. It's chemistry. But somehow, there is something that, uh, that says, are you in the singlet or in the triplet state? And that happens at a certain rate. And we know these rates because we know roughly how long this process takes. And actually, you can now do plots. And you can say, let's choose different, uh, different rates. And let's see how the singlet yield, which is the quantity that matters for vision, varies. And then you can see some kind of, in some units, uh, 10 to 6, I think this translates into a microsecond. It's the reciprocal, if you think about time. It's 10 to minus 6 seconds, 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 4. And you can see that, that if, you, if, if, if this noise, if you like, the projection has different features, if it goes down, this k, your visibility in some sense will become worse. So if you have a completely flat line here, that means whatever angle you have, you will get exactly the same response. You will not be able to tell the field. So the, so the vision is best uh, at the top, and it gets worse and worse as you ramp up this quantity. What we did on top of it then is said, what about general noise? What about general extra noise? So now we were trying to take into account this rapidly oscillating extra field in addition to chemistry. And again, it's the same type of Lindblad uh, equation that I don't want to bore you. This is one of those continuous, completely positive uh, maps that you can write down. It happens to be a relatively simple one because we still only have three spins. And out of these three spins, we are really only acting on the two electronic spins, which are the ones that matter for birds. And now you can plot, again, the same thing as a function of gamma. And you can say, let's look at these different gamma rates and see actually how much of a dephasing this model can take. How much of dephasing can a bird take? How long do they stay entangled? Coherent, I should say. There is a subtle difference. How long do they, do they stay entangled? And to our surprise, actually, um, the, amount, the amount of noise that they can withstand and still operate is 100 microseconds or larger. Okay? Why is this surprising? Because the world record in the Guinness Book of Records for maintaining the longest coherence time of the electron spin is only 80 microseconds. This is man-made, engineered with the latest technology, buckyball, insert the nitrogen inside, shielded from all environmental effects, and the decoherence time cannot be made more than 80 microseconds. Birds do it, if everything I've said so far is correct, which is highly unlikely probably. But with this model, birds can apparently do it in, in, for at least 100 microseconds. So they beat the best engineered molecule, just for the hell of it. So again, is there a reason why birds should do it for that long? No idea. We could do this 100 times faster and detect the magnetic field artificially. In chemistry people do that. So there doesn't seem to, me to be any obvious biological utility to the prolonged coherence time, but it happens to be there. Interesting final thing that I want to mention, I think you can read it in this paper on the archive. If you plot entanglement behavior during this noise, it actually doesn't persist for the whole time. And this 
I think makes us all suspect that entanglement is really not the main thing here. It does exist. And actually, it exists. I think the blue curve is the one that you should really look at. In some sense, it exists. The red curve is just saying coherence exists for this long, for the whole duration of the process. This says that somewhere halfway, after 50 microseconds, your entanglement is gone. All that you have is still a, a well-defined phase relationship between the spins, if you like to call it like that. So this is still not zero, but you have no entanglement there. It doesn't have the bells and equalities anymore. It still lasts here. So in some sense, I think entanglement is not, is not an important thing or crucially important. I think this is, an, this is an interesting lesson because, again, in our field, we tend to overemphasize the importance of entanglement. It's not clear that actually entanglement is needed for most of these things. Um, and, you know, the negativity is there if, you, if you're thinking how this is calculated and all of this stuff. So I'm very much at the, at the end of this. One thing I didn't talk about, and I think that's another... So quantum biology is really gathering momentum. I would say that at least uh, 20 or 30 people in our own field of quantum information already going in that direction. There is a vast amount of physicists out there already uh, having taken these steps a long time ago, 20 or 30 years ago. Another, another um, piece of evidence comes from photosynthesis, and like I said, I will, I will talk about it tomorrow much more. Um, and and the, the general name there is really electron transfer in molecules. So how do I get energy or and or electrons to hop between different sites? How coherent is this process in biological systems? And again, the first reaction would be to say, it's very hot environment, it's very complex, it's not going to be coherent, but we know the classical models cannot actually explain most of these things. And in many ways, we know that quantum mechanics is the way to, to go there. And then you can ask all sorts of other, other questions that I, thought, uh, that, I thought, uh, that I thought would be interesting. Of course, a really interesting question to ask is, if there is entanglement, and I show you there is entanglement, does it really have a purpose? Or is it just an accident? You know, are the systems protected enough for another reason that they anyway have entanglement there for free, but it's not a crucial thing? Very much like in the bird navigation, we don't really know uh, anything about that. And then the holy grail question, I think and some people are thinking about it a lot as well, uh, is, is basically could you even show, this to a physicist would be the, the most beautiful uh, answer, if you, if you could answer it as, as yes, is, is could you even actually show that life would be impossible without quantum mechanics? Classical physics does not allow, allow light. It was a very interesting debate in the 60s in nature, going back and forth between two people. One was called Wigner, that's D. Wigner, and the other one was called Peter Landsberg, is a, is a very well known British actually thermodynamicist. And they had an exchange of letters where Wigner initially proved that bio biological reproduction is impossible if quantum mechanics is the ultimate description. What he was really proving in his paper without knowing it is that no cloning is basically the no cloning theory, that you cannot clone that. But we know that biological, biological um, copying is not quite cloning, it's a different style. Uh, so I think that, that's how the, the debate went back and forth in the 60s, and I think we picked it up in the 80s and with no cloning and so on. So now I'm almost reversing this question. I'm saying rather than saying that life is impossible with quantum mechanics, could it be that it's only possible? If, if you allow superpositions and entanglements and stuff like that. And there are all sorts of crazy ideas there. I think some of them I mentioned already to you. But basically the idea would be that finding efficient replicators is something that really requires full quantum coherence at the beginning. So the ideas are explored by various people who say the initial replicators were not at all uh, acidic um, structures like, like the current ones, but were more like some very simple physical uh, structures like crystals, which then started somehow based just on the laws of physics to replicate themselves. themselves, And then they infected biological molecules. Somehow there was a transfer of this type of behavior to, to biology. And I think there are lots of exciting ideas there where physicists could probably do a better job than a biologist, given that this really is, a, is, is an ultimate physics uh, question. There's a lot more I could say about it. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to thank you for your attention and allow questions.
de, de, de mim Assumption they said about that uh, let's say thermal noise is not important is because the magnetic energy is ten times kT. This was in the ferromagnetic uh, case in the in the in the in the avian uh, compass that I was describing. This is simply because it, it takes an optical excitation uh, to bridge that uh, that gap. So you know if if you really a thermal state of this molecule at 300 Kelvin is simply almost 100% in the, in the ground state, seeing that. So it really requires visible light for birds to be able to trigger the whole chemical reaction. That's the main piece of evidence. Uh, I think the uh, um, local equilibrium thermodynamics fails in light because they have a strong yes. break rate. Yes. So, so DNA cannot satisfy the local equilibrium. Yes. But um, on the other hand, um, statistical mechanics works well to explain most of the DNA in the process. Yes. So yes. really, I, I don't know how many molecules are, are necessary to, to, okay, to explain thermodynamics. I see that's the real question. Yes, I, I like that comment very much because, we, yes, we tend to talk about these things in equilibrium, but of course this is a highly non-equilibrium non -equilibrium system. And yet you can go, the whole, you know, lots of polymer science, for example, is just based on taking statistical mechanics and directly importing and applying it, and very successful actually. So it's also, but this also I would say is a reductionistic method, and it doesn't, for lots of practical purposes, it doesn't require any any quantum mechanics, I fully agree with that. Actually. So to make certain, you know, properties of rubber, for example, and things like that, you don't really need quantum mechanical laws. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. That's why I think you have to be careful in choosing applications where you can actually identify that there must be something quantum mechanical. Otherwise, I agree, most of biology probably already follows from that. Yes. Yes. Again, it's a heresy in some circles that they shouldn't be saying it too loud. Maybe a. Uh, uh, most important question is what mechanic is necessary to yes. evolution of yes. determine a special points in yes. evolution. Yes. That's what they did in And again, some people are, are asking that question, but um, here, the evidence that we have from quantum computing is that when it comes to, to finding things like search algorithm, we cannot improve it more than just the square root. There's no exponential way of speeding things up. You know? so, if you show me that, that by randomly tossing molecules and putting them together, it would take you 10 to the power of 50 seconds to evolve life, which is much larger than the, you know, the age of the universe, the square root to that is not going to change the game, actually. Okay. So, one, so that, that's, that's one negative aspect where we're not sure, actually, how to proceed in that direction. So it's not clear that finding replicators is, is, a, is a much easier problem for quantum systems. It's a very good point. I have more comments than a question. And, and of course, you're, you're Serbian, and your uncle, which is Serbian, so you probably learned about him in high school. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually surprised that he that he's known in the in the set in the geological community. But uh, as far as I know, the Milankovitch cycle. I mean, the I don't, I don't know anything about the uh, how to go through this. Just just like discovery channel level of knowledge. Yes. It, as far as I know, the Milankovitch cycles are. Climate cycles, so ice ages, and has to do with precession of the Earth's perihelion and stuff like that. Whereas the, the, the magnetic switching is still an unknown mechanism, and it's a longer time scale. So I think it's mechanism. correlated. I think it's exactly. Well, it, it, it has to do with the dynamo of the. Of the and people don't know really well the dynamo of the of the lava. So this I'm not sure at all. And it's a longer time. Like if I remember, it's longer. It's like 200,000 years. I think it's 24. I understand, but we can yeah. check. We can check, can check that. We can check that. Yeah. An order of magnitude extra would then maybe you yeah. could say maybe there is some genetic adaptation to yeah. to 200,000 years uh, yeah. cycles. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's difficult to do experiments with them. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes, 
and I actually I want to ask about the article. The borrowing is different for your for your student. I found it while I was searching for an article that it used in the case to be without the title. Yes, I haven't found the article. Yes, I found. I'll try to. You know, this article had a very unfortunate history. It's one of those that was submitted to Nature because it really sounds like a, like a cool result. Nature said no. And I think the you know the, the the article went down via whatever PRL and so on to some kind of acta physica rejectica or whatever is that kind of <laughs> that kind of stuff. And and but interestingly enough, when it was published in that journal, then then the editor of Nature picked it up and wrote the news and views. So it's probably even better if you want to have a very quick look at what they did to read the the one page Nature news and views. So this was coming back with a vengeance. So it's even better than when you're ending up in Nature. But uh, specifically, why do you think uh, what they do don't prove that we're